host today this great seminar with a great speaker in the title. This is our fifth seminar in the series on gender research in action. In this multidisciplinary series, we draw from diverse backgrounds and countries' expertise and provide a space for discussing approaches and nuances of research on gender in relation to environment, development, and beyond. I have this privilege to host it today. My name is Marina Karzanevica. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in human geography at the School of Geography, Environment, and Oxford University. It's, uh, the seminar is co-hosted by two more people, uh, Maria Hillis, Dr. Maria Hillisland, Research Officer in Development Economics in the Department of International Development. Today, she's disguised under the nickname questions. All your questions, when you write them, will go directly to her. And uh, we also have another co-host, Rob Ferrito, a digital student on gender industrialization. He will ensure that everything runs really smoothly. We all represent the University of Oxford through water security for the poor by the women's science that transforms policy and practice. It is our fifth seminar and we upload all our seminars on YouTube. You, likewise, today's seminar will be available on YouTube today. You, uh, Rob will post the link where you can see all our previous seminars um, in the chat box. Um, brief uh, introduction of the format. We'll have a presentation for about 20 to 30 minutes, followed by Q&A sessions. All your questions will go to Maria, who will later group them accordingly. Um, before I introduce the speaker that you can see on the screen, I would like to briefly jump into our next, um, um, next speaker. If you want to uh, join us for the next seminar by Nicholas Rexton on exploring gender impacts of climate change through feminist ecological economics, please um, register. And Rob will again put the right uh, link for you. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Michelle Lacotte, who is a research practitioner at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She has a background working as a humanitarian practitioner focused on gender equality and gender based violence, currently works on the GOAL project funded by GCRF and CRC, which seeks to support government and mark partners to strengthen the mental health system for refugees and host communities in Lebanon. I'm very excited to hear uh, your presentation today, uh, Michelle, and I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, the screen is yours. <laughs> Thanks, Marina, um, and thanks for, for the opportunity to be here today. I'm excited to be able to, to speak to you all and hopefully have some good discussions at the end as well. Um, so just a quick uh, overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, so I'm going to start off by exploring and laying the groundwork for what the ideology of colonialism is and how we see that in development and humanitarian work and in global health. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what colonial behaviours look like in, a, in terms of research um, and then explore a little what it means to decolonize. And that will be done using a feminist approach, um, which is a helpful way of thinking about uh, power hierarchies. And then we'll end by looking at some strategies for decolonizing across different stages of the research process. Um, it's not an exhaustive um, view on all the different things that we can do to decolonize um, since we have a short time today but hopefully will help trigger some discussion and for anyone interested in knowing more as well um, next year I'm facilitating a four-day course which we just uh, finished recently but we will repeat next year in March uh, through the gender training platform Sinara on uh, decolonizing research and monitoring and evaluation so that will go into a lot more depth than we can today but I hope that you'll write your um, questions in the chat and send them uh, to the person label as questions if you have anything that you'd like to be discussed um, at the end. So to start off, um, I guess painting a picture, what do we mean when we refer to colonialism? Uh, so colonialism was basically the process, the policy of uh, controlling people and geographical regions, often through establishing colonies and with the aim of, um, of economic dominance. And the assumption underlying colonial intervention was that indigenous communities don't know how to do various things. So they don't know how to use their land. They don't know how to 
manage themselves. They don't know how to create institutions for law and order. They don't know how to, to think about things or to care for their children. And so these kinds of assumptions triggered colonial um, intervention in different settings. And colonialism was underpinned by this idea that people are different uh, and their difference from us uh, equates to inferiority. And we see this reinforced by the concept of Orientalism, which is a concept developed by the scholar Edward Said. And he describes how Middle Eastern and Asian and North African countries were essentialized as static, underdeveloped, um, and, and really sort of backwards in contrast to the modernity that's represented by the West. Um, and so there are many scholars that critique these descriptions of the exotic, which were often highly racialized. Um, and we see this a lot in colonialism, that this difference between us and them uh, was symbolized by the color of skin. So there's some, some uh, entanglements between race and colonialism. Um, the local or the colonized pal, uh, actor was never really equal to the colonial actor because of these skin color differences. Uh, but skin tone as well as gender lifted the status of some groups over others. So we see where the colonial power would identify people of a lighter skin tone and people who are men to uh, be in leadership positions within these colonial empires that they created. And this was part of the, um, the divide and conquer strategy that they used to control populations. Underlying colonialism as well was the idea of a civilizing mission. So Africa, for example, was presented as a savage, dark place that needs liberation. Uh, education and health and religion and norms for expected behavior were all areas where colonial powers felt this is an area that needs change. And there's very much a deficit narrative where people are in need in these settings, they are poor, they don't know how to look after themselves, they're lacking. Um, and we see this resulted in some very heavy hand ended decisions that were made by the colonial powers. And um, so for example, in Australia, where I am from, uh, we have what we call the stolen generation, uh, where the colonial settlers decided that indigenous communities were unable to care for their children. And so a whole generation of children were taken away from their indigenous families and placed into white settler families and raised in those families as a way to civilize them and bring them up in the right way. Um, and so this is part of um, some of the history of colonialism, which many of us will be familiar with and have heard stories about. Um, the civilizing mission, I think it's also important to note, also included enforcing certain gender ideologies. Uh, so in some settings, gendered expectations for behavior were completely new uh, and they subverted the relationships and the power dynamics between women and men. Uh, so for example, in societies that were matrilineal and then shifted after um, colonial intervention. In some cases, colonial power introduced a binary, a male and female binary perspective on gender when communities originally had a non-binary binary perception. And in other cases, the colonial powers didn't necessarily start a new gender ideology, but they really provided a stronger rationale for putting women in positions of subjugation to men. And they really fed into existing ideologies about women's status and used this also to divide the population. All of these uh, sort of ideologies and actions were really underpinned by the idea that the actions of the colonizers are done for the good of humankind. We're doing this for their own good. We're doing this to make their lives better. Uh, part of the Europeans discovering lands and peoples also meant that they took resources, they took commodities from colonized countries. And another thing they did is they wanted to understand the culture of this other. They wanted to understand the way of life um, of these communities. And the question which uh, colonial powers asked themselves, well, are they human? Are they like us? Are they really... Um, you know, are they actually human beings or are they something else? And this was a question that European settlers grappled with. And they, in fact, conducted research studies to understand racial difference. Um, and these studies were often today that we would see are really problematic, but included things like removing the remains of indigenous communities from ancient burial grounds. Um, and so there were some really sort of blatant acts of problematic research. Um, and then we know that the discipline of anthropology was embedded and originated from the colonial enterprise. And so these European anthropologists would come out to live with these natives, to live with the tribes, to learn about their practices, to watch them, to document them, to map them. Um, and so this is part of the, the legacy and the history of colonialism.
And so if we summarize these actions as behaviors, um, I think an overarching principle is this idea of a power hierarchy, which positions the colonizer as superior and the colonized as inferior. And there are a few key ways in which we see colonial power manifesting itself. So firstly, being top down in decision making. So colonial powers took control over land and resources. They made decisions about what areas they felt needed reform and needed transformation and change. And they decided what was best. Um, another thing that happened was that they didn't value community knowledge or expertise. So Western knowledge was positioned as superior. Community ways of knowing and ways of living, ways of caring for themselves and finding food weren't seen as being traditional or backwards and needed change. Um, there was this assumption of what communities wanted and what they needed without necessarily asking them. Um, so issues like education and health and religion were areas that were major focuses of reform for the colonial powers, but without necessarily a conversation happening about whether people wanted help with these topics. Uh, using a Western worldview as the standard and norm for what counted as modern. So this is what we might call today as the white gaze. Uh, Northern whiteness is used as, uh, as a way of measuring the South and measuring progress. Uh, within this, communities were presented as the other. Uh, they're vastly different in culture. They represent the exotic, the barbaric. They became objects of fascination and voyeurism. And we see this depicted in artwork. Um, and you can sort of look at that if you're particularly interested in, in looking at how that, those depictions happened. And then lastly, colonialism often presents with a quite righteous tone, uh, suggesting the other needs correction uh, and, and that there's some kind of injustice or something that's wrong that needs fixing. Um, and so these are a list of, not, not exhaustive lists, but a list of some indicators, things that might represent um, behaviors that we see in colonial um, action. And um, I think the clearest modern example of colonial action would be the role of Israel in occupying Palestine. So we can see that as a live ongoing issue. And there might be others you can think of as well. I wanted to share a few examples focused on humanitarian aid and development and global health, just to think about the ways in which we might see some of these behaviors and these ideologies uh, around colonialism in our world today. Um, so firstly, a few images from uh, humanitarian and development settings, uh, and we see depictions of communities of displaced populations as always lacking, as needing modernity. Um, mothers holding their children, needing something to care for them, children being hungry, children being moved across borders, like that bottom image of a, a child from Syria. Um, on the right, we see the intersection between gender and colonialism. Uh, we have this you know, quintessential image of a veiled girl, and but yet, look, she has access to education because of our intervention. Um, and these these depictions really show communities as needing something. Um, you know, they. Um, they, they don't have what they need in order to survive. You've lost your home, you've lost their family. Now you have your period. Um, they have no underwear, no sanitary products. This is the lack and, um, and this needs modernity and needs to be modernized. The idea of modernity being needed is also um, maybe most evident when we think about a tool that's used a lot in humanitarian and development work, which is the log frame. Um, and this tool originated in the US Army and was integrated into development work as a means of planning out the activities, the outputs, the outcomes, and then ultimately the overarching goal of projects and of development interventions. And the rationale was that this is how progress happens. Um, this is what change looks like, A, B, C. Um, Rosalind Eben, uh, she has critiqued this fixation on quantifying within international development. Um, and we see this emerging in the log frame, this, this fascination with trying to numerically uh, position what change looks like. And she suggests it mirrors the objectification and the counting behaviors of those who sought to document and map out the natives as part of colonialism. And we know that research was conducted to try and understand them, map their borders, count them. Um, and we see this sort of thread coming through in some of the ways in which people are measured and monitored. White saviorism can also be sometimes part of research interventions. 
Um, and we see this a lot, uh, especially around celebrity action and this kind of self-promotion that happens uh, when people who are perceived as being in need are given something. Um, Gayatri Spivak uh, in her very famous piece talks about this idea of saving brown women from brown men and how this drives the actions of those uh, who are in the North. Um, and they, they have this idea that they need to be saved, they need to be rescued. And we see threads of white saviors in how communities are depicted as well. So this slide depicts a handful of reports uh, on uh, refugee and IDP communities released by international NGOs and UN actors and some of this presenting research that was done in partnership with universities. So the idea here is there is a problem and we are the rescuers. Um, these women are driven by desperation. They're forced to use sex to, to care for themselves. The streets are full of danger. There's no safe haven, no safe place. And these are the kinds of, of narratives that, that also help to position certain people as the rescuers and certain people as the ones in need. Um, the colonial narratives that we see today often have a strong gender dimension. So narratives about girls, for example, are that they hold unlimited potential. And so the popular girl effect video declares girls to be the solution to war, to poverty, to hunger. And the message is invest in a girl and she will do the rest. And there's a strong modernity message that underpins this. Uh, girls lack knowledge, they're burdened by their culture and tradition, as if these things are only present in Africa or the Middle East or Asia. Um, and it's a neoliberal argument as well. Uh, empowerment equals economic development, which is seen as the ultimate indicator um, of modernity. So just a few practical examples here to get us thinking about where we might see threads um, of colonialism within humanitarian and development work. And now thinking specifically about research. Um, so I've listed here a few problems with research that might have some colonial underpinnings, but this is not exhaustive, but just helps us think a little bit about how it relates to research. So the first is top down, north, south and donor driven agendas. Um, those in positions of power um, are the ones who decide on the research topics. Uh, donors, for example, set aside funding and they say you can apply under these set topics for this amount of funding. Um, people who sit in New York and London offices might choose a research topic and design a scope and then they pass off the local, uh, the data collection to locals. Um, the interests, uh, their own interests and their motivations, politics and what is trending can often drive the way that research is formulated. And this means that research might not always be relevant to communities. So similar to how issues and ideologies are imposed on colonized countries, uh, we often see research topics not chosen by those who are in the setting. Uh, their voices are not necessarily heard and their interests and, um, and needs are not necessarily, necessarily recognized. Um, and there are some uh, very important issues around capacity that come up when we think about research. Um, local actors or organizations collect data for others to analyze and there's this power dynamic there. They collect the data and they pass it on to international actors who are normally consultants uh, and, and they are the ones who are deemed as having high capacity. They can do the analysis, they've got the technical skills. Uh, interestingly, recipients of aid and development and even local and national organizations may also have this per perception, you know, they're the ones with the expertise, they are the ones who do the analysis, because this is what be has been messaged and this has been told to them, you don't have the capacity, you do this part and we do our part. And we see uh, international actors building the capacity of local actors, for example, and this language is very pervasive uh, in humanitarian and development work. If, lo if local capacity is recognized at all, it's often only in fra framed in terms of local actors having knowledge of the context. Oh, they have knowledge of the context. That's what they can bring. And that's the only thing that they can bring. Uh, we know there are different pay and benefit structures between international and local actors, and these reinforce inequity. Uh, the language used about communities can also often be patronizing and paternalistic. Terms like marginalized, vulnerable, beneficiary, all feed into a power dynamic of certain people needing something and certain people being able to provide it. And we also see this idea of progressing towards being modern or being less traditional within research, tracking people's attitudes and behaviors and changes and uh, the way that they think and what they believe about different issues and trying to show that these change over time due to interventions. 
in research, we sometimes see that local knowledge is not valued. It doesn't matter what their traditional practices are or their other um, sort of indigenous ways of collecting data. Instead, expert or modern knowledge may be what counts. We see this idea also of research as an objective, neutral process, uh, just like the colonial power trying to document and count um, the people, whereas positionality and power and vested interests are things that often shape research processes. There's also a lack of consideration of positionality along with that. We don't think enough as researchers about the power and the experiences that we bring and how that might influence the research. There are assumptions about how change occurs. You know, we have theory of change diagrams, we have log frames, um, and this is how we expect communities and people groups will change over time. So these are a few ideas to help us think about our own research. So what does it mean to decolonize? So I'm not gonna get into debates about decolonizing versus decoloniality, colonialism and coloniality, and all these terms are debated and debated. Um, but for me, I think it's more productive to get into what it looks like in practical terms. And what does this mean when we actually consider our research practice? So originally the term decolonizing was about a colonial power withdrawing or being forced to withdraw and this uh, country now becoming independent. And now we think of it as a way of dismantling, deconstructing, challenging, breaking down colonial ideologies. The decolonizing movement suggests that we can't completely dismantle colonialism, but we can minimize its impact. And the underpinning belief of colonizing, decolonizing uh, is that the racial logic of colonialism has continued, even though the colonizers may have left, these power dynamics are still continuing. Um, and so activists and, um, and scholars who work on decolonizing say that we first need to look at the impacts of colonialism and then develop strategies to minimize impact. In the humanitarian and the development sector, efforts to decolonize has, have also been linked to, to localization. Uh, so since the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016, we see this push towards thinking about power and changing the way we're working. And this kind of language is a lot more common in the sector. I just also want to say that not all aid and development is automatically colonial. We might see threads and uh, different behaviors and ideologies in some of their actions, but there are examples, for example, of um, local to local aid during the COVID pandemic, for example, that weren't colonial. And there are different organizations that are explicitly trying to do things in a uh, less colonial way. Also important to note, the idea of decolonizing is not new. Um, there are also a lot of critiques about how using the language of decolonizing has become a bit performative, people using the term without actually doing the work. And there's a danger that efforts to decolonize can become a tick the box activity without critical reflection and transformation of power structures. There's also a danger that uh, work on diversity and inclusion can be labeled and, and mixed in with decolonizing. And diversity and inclusion are really important topics, but they are different to decolonizing in many ways. Um, diversity inc and inclusion often focused on issues like gender and race and disability, but they don't necessarily involve reflecting on colonial power dynamics, which are very different in their structure. Lessons from decolonizing activists suggest that um, decolonizing requires reflecting on the past, which is why we started by looking a bit at the history. And then it also requires reflecting on our personal and our institutional practices. And so this process of reflection is really important and has to shape the strategies that are taken forward. So what does it mean to take a feminist approach to decolonizing? Um, so feminism is a theoretical approach that's grounded in the idea that power hierarchies shape the lives of women and men, and that women are subordinated to men within patriarchal systems. Feminists try to challenge and, and unravel these power dynamics to bring about equality, um, to ensure that women, men, and increasingly people who don't identify as binary can access the same rights, opportunities, and status. And we already talked about how power is really central to the concept of colonialism and feminists uh, recognize this role of power and they also look at it in an intersectional perspective so looking at the way that gender and colonialism might intersect um, and I think also important to flag that there's not just one feminism but there are feminisms there are many strands and the history of 
of feminism has developed um, over time, each strand and each wave of feminism considering coloniality to different degrees. What is important to think about if we're trying to find commonalities between the feminisms is the idea of situating power and being intersectional. Um, and so these are really important components. Uh, feminisms are also grounded in reflexivity. So thinking and reflecting on our own power, which we'll um, talk a little bit about shortly. Um, I also wanted to flag this idea of post-colonial or third world feminism. And this is really a reaction against feminisms that seem to only reflect the experiences of white or Western women. Um, and these feminists argued there's not a global sisterhood, but different women experience patriarchy differently. And they looked at racism and, uh, and colonialism and how these are intertwined. Uh, they critiqued the way that third world women were depicted as, as victims, as perpetually pregnant, as, as oppressed. Um, and they said, we need to recognize women are not a homogenous group, but class and race, ethnicity, education, these other factors shape their lives. So what does a feminist approach offer to research? Uh, so firstly, it involves reflecting on and challenging power hierarchies during the research process, having a really critical approach to look inwards as well as outside around the structures that influence our lives. Fem feminist perspectives also mean that there should be some benefit to participants that happens as a result of the research. So does the research help? And is it improving people's lives? That's a key question that feminists will ask. And we might write that in our proposals, like this will result in X, Y, Z, but we don't often see the change that results as a, because of our research. And so feminists really bring that to the fore. Feminists also um, suggest that we need to situate how we describe people's lives in their power hierarchies, identities, in their material conditions, recognizing that power is shifting, it's changing, and that people's experiences are not homogenous, but they're contextual and based on where they're situated. Um, and so in order to do this, it requires reflexivity, thinking about power and thinking about positionality. Feminist research also um, focus on some of the practicalities. Is there reciprocity in this research process? Is there give and take or are we just coming and extracting content, conducting interviews and group discussions and then we're gone? Is the community getting something back? And part of that is, um, is building research within an ethics of care framework that uh, emphasizes interpersonal relationships that grounds the research within relationships and that even comes to value the relationship over the data which is really different to how some of our institutions operate. Feminist researchers center the value of communities, uh, the knowledge of communities um, and take inductive rather than necessarily deductive approaches. So they're not trying to prove a hypothesis, but they're letting knowledge and theory generation happen based on what people say and what they contribute as knowledge. Um, and then lastly, uh, in feminist research, the researcher is not neutral, but they bring their own knowledge, their perspectives, their power um, to the research and that influences how they work. So just as we move into discussion, I just want to flag a couple of ways in which we might think about how to bring a decolonial feminist lens to our research. And I've structured this across uh, three different phases of research. The scoping phase, firstly, is where we are thinking about what we're going to conduct our research on. We might already have the funding or we might be applying. We're trying to put partnerships in place, decide what methods we will use, what objectives, what's our question. Um, and at this stage, there are critical opportunities to be uh, bringing a decolonial feminist lens. Um, and this key opportunity emerges often with the choice of the research topic itself. So often our research is underpinned by the assumption that something is a problem. You know, we've done a literature review and we've identified a gap, but we don't necessarily talk to anyone who the issue relates to. Um, and so we might miss that this problem that we've identified, this gap might not be a problem to everyone. Identifying who we're accountable to when we select a research topic is important. And our accountability can be influenced by a range of factors, by politics, by our own background, by vested interests, by funding availability. It could also reflect something is trending or marketable from an advocacy or funding perspective. So in the humanitarian world, topics like refugee resilience or child marriage might be particularly trending and have uh, greater success at generating funding. If we assume we already know what the issues are, what the problem is, then we might also be closed off to new or unexpected data. We might rely on old knowledge from other settings instead of seeking to understand a new setting. So one way in which we can um, really sort of take a step back 
while we're selecting our research topic and think about what we're bringing in our own interests and assumptions is to think about positionality. So positionality is the stance, the position we hold. Um, and it's used in feminist work as well as other disciplines to think about how race and gender, age, education level, uh, all these different factors might influence how we're thinking about this research. And so this activity is what I often, often do with our field teams to think about um, what, what do I bring? What positions and power and privilege do I bring? Uh, what experiences do I bring? And how might that shape the research process? So an example from my own life, um, from my Sri Lankan identity and the fact that my parents left Sri Lanka in the 1980s due to ethnic conflict and the fact that they were Tamils, and that shapes how I see the world. Uh, it's influenced my involvement in volunteer work with refugee communities and then the employment that's focused on refugee work. Um, and this desire to help also then intersects with my faith. Um, the issues I choose to focus on also intersects with my gender uh, and is shaped by my education and, and uh, the sort of different places that I've lived in. And so we bring these entanglements into our research practice. They influence what we choose to focus on what narratives we might be open or closed to, what stories we choose to amplify and silence. And that's just us as individuals, there's also our institutions. Uh, they have their own identities. They might be, we might call them white, we might call them international or global. They might be funded by big donors. They might be known for certain things like effectiveness or, um, or a reputation for um, responding in solidarity with communities. This all shapes the decisions that they make, the research that they're interested in and what is deemed worthy of attention. And so positionality is a really key starting point for any kind of feminist work. Also in the scoping phase, when we're thinking about what our research looks like and what methods we're going to use, thinking about how knowledge is valued and measured. And this is about who is a source of data and who is left out, who produces knowledge, who doesn't. Um, and here thinking about key informants is really important. We often talk about key informants. Um, we say we're doing key informant interviews, but we fail to sometimes recognize that these key informants represent an elite in their community. They're often leaders, most often male, and they often have higher education or social standing. Um, the same group is often asked to represent the community time and time again, whereas they might be some distance away from the community. And when we constantly talk to them only, we signal that it's their voice that matters. Um, and it does take more effort to engage with, you know, an ordinary community member compared to interviewing a staff member from an NGO or technical expert. But that also influences how um, we position the knowledge. Um, how we define expertise is tied to whose knowledge we value. Um, I think the methods we also choose um, determine what we value. If we're only always conducting quantitative research, we might reinforce power dynamics between data collectors and communities. Why? Because it's it's a more clinical engagement with the community to be sort of administering a survey. They can be quite top down in nature. We have you know, not much room for, for expansion or deviation. There's multiple choice options. Um, and this can be really limit people's ability to, to participate and also sometimes be grounded in the idea that we know best. Uh, if we contrast focus group discussions, for example, there's more scope for going off track or an interview. There's scope for the person to share their own knowledge and experiences and they might veer wildly off the interview guide. Um, and so there are different ways in which the method itself is important. It doesn't mean that it's just about the method. It's also about the way it's administered. For example, you can administer a survey in ways that capture the in-between comments that people make when they answer A, B, or C. They might explain why they answered A, B, or C. And we so often miss those dynamics, those qualitative bits, because we're focused on getting the, um, you know, getting the answers. Thinking about the data collection period, just in the last two minutes here, um, thinking about positionality and power again here is important. There are power hierarchies that affect uh, who collects data. It's often the low paid local actors who collect data that's then analyzed by someone else. And we sometimes position data collection as a low skill activity and the analysis is done by experts. Um, and decision making about data often occurs some distance from where the data was collected. We also don't often think about the power hierarchies of those who collect the data their gender, their race, their religious background. They have relationships in communities and may hold particular views about the topic that could influence how they ask the questions. But we don't necessarily have those opportunities for reflection. And then lastly, looking at the analysis and sharing phase as we come to our discussion 
um, thinking about who is included and who is excluded from analysis um, and how we represent people. So data collectors, those who've been immersed in the data collection are often not included in the analysis. Um, my ex own experience using our teams in Lebanon in this process has been so interesting, seeing how um, they've not only felt that they're able to develop new skills, but they're really part of the research. They conduct the interviews and they're also part of coding the data, having those discussions about what are the key themes, how do we write this up, and really trying to, um, to really think of that research process a bit differently. And then thinking about communities, you know, how are they involved in conclusions made about their lives? Do they have a say in the recommendations? We often talk about validation or feedback sessions, but sometimes these end up merely about just informing people of the findings. Um, and there's a difference, I think, between informing people, between consulting them, and then actually creating space, asking them, you know, what do you think the recommendation should be? And then lastly, there are prob problems with how issues are represented ethically by those who are outside the context, how we present stories, how we summarize or, or simplify particular elements, um, the language that we use, as well as the visuals. We might use us and them language that position the communities as other. Uh, we might refer to lack of modernity or cultural values or tradition uh, as a way that makes it sound like culture is a problem to be solved. How do we solve it? With, with empowerment, with knowledge, with more information and agency. And the assumption is they don't have these things, uh, but they need to be provided with them. And then thinking about, I think, how we represent communities is important. It's part of closing the loop on that research process. And we sometimes get stuck in, okay, the report is done, but then other people might take it forward and represent communities in particular ways. But really following that through um, and really influencing that process is sometimes something we might miss. Um, I'm going to pause there and um, and hand over for a bit of discussion. So this was just to give you um, a little bit of a taster into some of the issues to think about, but we can um, we can now have a bit of discussion about this. Thank you, Michelle. That was oh sorry, my video. <laughs> That was absolutely wonderful, and uh, I felt like it was such a rush, was such a big topic, and you could talk a lot about every single slide, and I wish I could hear more. And there are lots of things that I have picked up on um, on how people had that decolonization is not, not new at all, but at the same time, um, people also um, sometimes fall into this discourse of white saviorism, um, so it's kind of like the resistance and complying at the same time. There are lots of things that I could talk, but I have lots of questions um, coming. The first one, it's a very uh, technical question. And Rob, maybe you can help as well. It comes, comes from Kate, um, who is asking about the name of scholar who has critiqued the quantification of development programs. And maybe you could also mention the course you, um, you mentioned to begin with, so we can type it in the, in the chat box. Um, yes, so I'm just typing her name. I don't know if these messages are going to everyone or just to the person questions, but um, so Rosalind Eben, Eben, I'm not sure how you pronounce her name. So she used to be at the Institute of Development Studies and she, um, yeah, so she talks about the quantifying and, um, and the documenting of the population. Yeah, great. So now I have two questions. I'll say them straight away. You can um, um, answer however you please. First one is from Martha Tsepa. Sorry if I mispronounce it. And, I, and I'm also sorry that I, I'm going to read all your questions because I feel like this is a very debated topic and we'll have a lot of questions just to save time. So Martha is asking, women empowerment is big in international development as a, uh, as a term. And she feels uncomfortable using the term empowerment. And I fully agree with you, Martha. <laughs> Um, and she says, in my opinion, it suggests a lack of agency. Could you please comment on it? And the second question is from um, Savita. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry, it just jumped out. Maybe you can answer this first question. Well, um, yes, for sure. So definitely, I think there are lots of problems with the term empowerment. Um, and the term was originally used and was based in the work of Paolo Freire that was meant to be an empowering activist term uh, that signified political action. And, um, and we see over time that the term has changed and lost its meaning and become very diluted. Um, so in any 
international development or humanitarian document that you look at, you will find that word dropped in throughout um, and often without sort of a deeper explanation or sometimes equated to economic development. And I've just put in the chat there if you're able to share that. Um, so Srilatha but but. But Liwala, she has written a really interesting piece on empowerment and the meaning of empowerment. And she and Andrea Cornwall as well talk a lot about how this term has deviated from its orig origins. It's lost its teeth. It's become really diluted and watered down. Um, and so definitely, I think there are issues and problems with the term empowerment. Um, in terms of agency, we also see that being used more. Um, so I recently wrote a paper on the term agency and how it relates to child marriage with a group of people at uh, the London School here so you can find that online and we have another paper coming out shortly with um, findings on child marriage from Cameroon and Somalia where we look at how communities conceive their own agency and what it means. Um, agency is also tricky because it sometimes involves a value judgment that's made on the outcome that results from the agency. So if someone makes a good decision they stay with their education, they decide not to get married, for example, we say they've exercised agency. But if they make a decision that we, as practitioners or academics, we think, oh, that's, that's not a very good decision, she probably should have stayed at school, or that wasn't the wisest thing to agree to that marriage, um, then we say, well, that's not agency. That's, you know, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the, the right uh, information, they're using it, they made a decision to survive instead of um, a real decision. And so I think it becomes really problematic when we think about agency as involving a good decision or a right choice, uh, because then who makes that choice and who is the um, one who stands in judgment to say this is agency and this is not. And it's often us, we as the, um, the practitioners and the researchers who do that. Um, so I think the term agency agency is interesting, but it has also been a little bit misused. And if you're interested, our paper looks a little bit at this. Thanks for those questions. Great questions. And then I have a question from Sarah, who is uh, a bit disheartened, saying, as a white Western British researcher conducting research in the global south, is the only way for me to decolonize my research to simply not do it. Um, and I'm going to read another question as well from Alec on um, Ben Slama. Thank you, Dr. Wakat, for a wonderful presentation. Do you have an example from your own personal research where you encountered colonial power hierarchies, in particular with Western academics going to Asia, Africa, or the Middle East to study people and then research them? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll take that first question first about feeling disheartened. So I don't think it means that we can never conduct research, but I think it's about thinking about how we do the research. Um, and so much of our research is shaped by our institutions and the settings that we're in, but sometimes we do have the power to make changes that can make things better, that can shift the power. Um, even a small decision like having our teams reflect together about the power they hold before they go out and you know, interview 100 refugees can be a really important and critical step. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're erasing the power dynamics, but at least being aware of them and thinking about them is an important start. And then I think thinking about how, um, how we collect data, what kinds of data we privilege and don't privilege and the opportunities that we give for communities to be part of the process from the beginning. And for me, that's a really critical one that we don't just come up with these topics or sitting in our offices um, or now our homes and we come up with this great proposal, but are we actually hearing from communities on what is important to them? Um, and, and I think that is a really key opportunity where it has real potential to actually make a difference for people's lives. And going back to that feminist idea of bringing benefit, I think um, you can bring benefit when it's directly linked to, to what people want and what people need, but we don't often have those discussions or ask those questions. Um, for various reasons, for you know, funding deadlines, and we don't have time to create partnerships and all these things that are challenges. Um, but definitely, I think trying to take small steps is, is important. I don't think it's an all or nothing approach, like you don't have to have this perfect decolonized project, but let's in the next project, try and do a few things differently. Let's in the next proposal, uh, bring in a few more opportunities to hear from communities throughout the process, not just at the end, or not just when we interview them. And um, so I think there are things we can do, but try to take it as a step-by-step -step process um, and as a learning process, and it doesn't have to be all at once. <laughs> 
Um, and then the second question, examples of, was that examples of where I've seen colonial power hierarchies? Yes. Oh, well, I mean, there are so many. Um, I think, um, gosh, what to choose from? I guess thinking specifically about research, I can, I can think, for example, of multiple situations I've been in where, um, you know, there's, there's a meeting recently realized there's a, a, a funding, this is when I was a practitioner, there's some extra money. Oh, look, there's an extra $20,000. Uh, Michelle, can you just quickly do a quick research about adolescent girls um, or something about disability if you can as well. And so then you, you know, you have you know, five weeks just quickly because we need to use the money. And so I think that is a real example of a funding pressure intersecting with um, a very top-down approach to how research is done. You just pick, like literally this happened to you, being told, you know, just do it about adolescent girls. Why? Because that's really, um, you know, trending right now. People are interested in girls. Everyone's talking about girls. They're slipping through the cracks. We need to research them. And so then that becomes the way in which um, the the power dynamic happens. Um, so I think that that's probably a, a really key example, but I can definitely think of more in terms of how communities are engaged with, how much time we give to hear from them, even the fact that, you know, we only talk to experts when we do interviews and the communities can only participate in a focus group discussion or in a survey. In a survey, they're trapped within the survey structure. In a focus group discussion, not everyone can speak and sometimes the loudest voices or the consensus views dominate. But in an interview, in an interview, you have more scope. You can change the topic a bit. You can ask your own questions. It's more of a, it can be more of a conversation, but we don't always interview the regular community members. We want to hear from the, the chief. We want to hear from the community leader. We want to hear from the head of the organization or the head of the UN agency rather than just a regular person. Um, and so I think thinking about those hierarchies in our work um, and thinking about how there are ways to change them, I think is really important. And uh, actually the second, the next question is very much related to it from Gao Tamipan. He's uh, asking if you have seen the resistance to this type of research, which perfectly fits to what you have just said. Yeah, I mean, the biggest, the biggest challenge and resistance I think is time and funding. So it takes time to do this kind of work. It's much harder to identify community members to speak to than it is to you know, quickly get a list of some NGO people that you can do a Zoom call with. So it's, um, I think time is the biggest challenge and we often do things in a very rushed way. Um, and this in humanitarian settings, I think the urgency to respond and the emergency status of the crisis can also make us feel really rushed and like there's no time to really get deep into those issues. We can only do like a rapid assessment. We even hear now of rapid ethnography when ethnography is the very opposite of rapid. Um, it's where you're meant to be embedded in the communities for a long time. And so we see this sort of emergence of different kinds of doing quick and dirty research um, that is basically because of lack of time. Um, so I think the taking advantage now more than ever, there's so much debate and interest in decolonizing and localizing aid in trying to change power dynamics. People are talking about it more than ever before. And so I think this is a critical opportunity where we can start to push back and start to talk to donors and have those conversations to say, actually, no, I need more money to do this research because I'm taking a different kind of approach because I'm not just interviewing a bunch of bureaucrats or technical experts, I'm talking to people in the field or it's gonna take a longer time because I am not rushing in and out, but I'm getting to know the people first before I go in and interrogate them. Um, so I think using opportunities to advocate and to speak to donors. I was recently at a, um, a conference where someone who used to work for DFID for the UK aid division, uh, she said that, um, you know, sometimes she knew that a project could be improved, but it was just laziness on her part. She didn't push the um, person who the money was being given to to challenge themselves or to think of a different way of doing it. Um, and so sometimes we might think, oh, you know, the donor is, is so strict and they're so unapproachable and they're going to say no, but sometimes it's because we don't ask. And so I think pushing those boundaries, uh, trying to shift the power starts with our engagement with the donors and trying to bring in moments to have those conversations. And I think more donors are open to it than what we think. 
um, they're waiting as well for us to start those conversations and to say, I have an idea. This is how we want to do things differently. This is the process we're going to take. It might not have the outcomes we uh, originally anticipated, but it's going to be better in the longer term. Um, and so I think being bold about having those conversations is also important. Well, we have two questions that are going to group and then we have two more afterwards. So as I expected, <laughs> this question is from Tala Rost and Shivani Sadija. Sadija. So they are asking uh, if you can um, um, explain how the process uh, how the process of disseminating the research can be done in a decolonizing way. And from Tala, Tala she is also asking um, how it can be done into, with, the, with the labor of people who you work with, the local researchers, and their labor not being recognized in research spaces with the researcher getting credit. And yeah. then two later, because they are a little bit different. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Um, so firstly, starting with the question about credit. So I think having conversations at the beginning about how people who are local are going to be included in the work, final work products is really important. So in our project in Lebanon, for example, we um, have a paper that's probably going to be ready in like a year and a half or so, a year maybe. Um, and we are talking now about um, how the staff who collected the data, um, who went and did that legwork, um, will be part of the authorship team and how they can be included. And they've never been involved in analysis before and now to be at the last stage as well, the authorship as well is a really, um, is a different way of doing things. Um, but it was really important for us to set that and to be clear about that from the beginning so that people um, realize that they are, you know, they're being valued. I've also seen the opposite where suddenly at the end, uh, people say, oh, you know, it looks really bad. Everyone's from the UK on this authorship team. Let's like put a few names in. And suddenly um, these local names appear and they weren't part of the process. They didn't know about it. And at the end, they asked to review a manuscript and they say, okay, I think it's fine. Um, but that's also, I think, an example of, of how tokenism can be part of, um, of the way that this happens. Um, but we want to try and be more intentional. We want to um, think about ways of including people from the beginning. And I think it can be very, really disheartening when you collect so much data to then not be part of the analysis and not be asked questions about it and not have a chance to get into the data and explain why you think this was. And actually this participant, they seemed really angry about this point. And I wonder if it's that, that could be linked to this theme. And I think we miss so many opportunities to really deepen our analysis because we're so focused on like a fast, quick process. It does take time to involve more people in analysis and then in the final work product. But I think ultimately it's uh, it, it ends up with a better piece of work, a piece of work that's more likely to be relevant to people's lives. Um, so definitely I think local researchers need to have credit and they need to be brought in from the beginning. And then sharing of data. So I think, um, you know, we often conduct validation sessions where we give them the communities a summary of the data findings. And then we sometimes let them um, you say yes or no, does that sound right? Or they might add a few points, uh, but we don't always give them chances to reflect on the recommendations or to say what they think should happen as a result of this. Um, so that's one thing, the validation stage. And then I think the final work product, how do we present it in ways that are accessible to communities? Sometimes the, the research isn't even accessible to our own, like the people involved in the research team. Um, for example, someone in our Lebanon team who doesn't have like access to this top tier journal where we publish and they can't even get the PDF. Um, and so I think, I think thinking about those things and trying to make sure that the final products are accessible, whether it's through policy briefs, whether it's through, you know, just simply sharing documents or whether it's through more creative outputs. Um, so we're working with a really great organization called Positive Negatives um, and they work with people on their research projects, but they don't just come in at the beginning and think of a nice infographic to make, but they are part of the research team from the beginning, from the first um, stage of framing the research and they are part of discussing the findings. And then at the end, they um, help to develop these really great sort of co-designed work products um, that are available in multiple languages that communities themselves can read their comics, their, there's films, there's animations. It's all really interesting and accessible to people. And so thinking of ways to do that more creatively in people's own language, uh, not assuming that English is always the language in which we need to share it, but really um, budgeting for different ways of sharing the data and then including people in that process. 
Um, and so, yeah, so we're really excited about what our um, research outputs will be for our project in Lebanon um, and hoping to, to have some of these creative outputs as part of the process in English and Arabic as well. Uh, we have three questions, uh, two of them I can group a little bit. Uh, so Sarah Johnson is uh, as asking, how do you get around power dynamics when the reason you are conducting research on the population is because they are vulnerable and often forgotten, especially in your presentation when you weren't labeling people against, uh, against the vulnerable, to, be, to label against vulnerable. Another question, how do you reconcile conducting research in a location that you have no personal connection to experience in? Um, and the third one, which is slightly different, but I'm going to read it because I know maybe you can structure your answer. What are your thoughts about uh, balancing um, bringing in feminist thinking and also making sure the science, data findings, etc. are unbiased and partial attended of doing science? Sorry, can you just repeat the last question? What are your thoughts about balancing, bringing in feminist thinking and also making sure the science, data findings, et cetera, are unbiased and impartial as, uh, as a tenet of doing science? Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Lots of <laughs> tricky, big questions there. Um, so firstly, I would say it's not just feminist thinking that would say research is not neutral. Um, I think it's increasingly in a lot of disciplines we see more critical reflection on the fact that it's not always realistic to say, you know, this is an unbiased piece of research. Um, someone had to make a decision somewhere that was based on something that <laughs> that they that is linked to who they are and what power they hold and their own motivations. And, and so all these things create what we might call bias or what we might say is you know less neutral or not objective and so I don't think it's a case of like feminist research is un is is unbiased and all the other research is scientific and robust but I think it's really about recognizing that any research uh, qualitative or quantitative really carries with it judgments and decisions and politics and vested interests and motivations from the beginning even you know the most innocuous survey is based on someone's assumptions about what a problem is, is based on decisions that were made uh, based on an individual's view of what is important to ask and what should not be asked and what, what are the three options the participants will answer according to. And so I think it's really important to think about that. It's not a case of feminist versus um, you know, real research, um, but there's increasing momentum and discussion about how um, you know, research is, is subjective, it's not neutral, it's the researcher holds so much power um, and so much influence in that process that we can't completely erase ourselves out of it. Um, the next point, so about conducting research in settings where we have no experience or connection. Yeah, so I think that's part of the problem with, um, with sort of international or expert researchers or consultants sailing in, parachuting in and conducting research on topics that they don't necessarily know about in settings that they're not familiar with. Um, I mean, it's not to say it's impossible. We can, of course, make ourselves aware of, of settings and learn and come with a humble attitude. But I think it's about understanding what knowledge we bring and then what knowledge is already there that we don't need to think that you know I need to bring that as well um, so I think it's about it's about balancing that recognizing that um, sometimes we don't have all the knowledge and maybe my role is to just sit in an office and say on day one you go to this location on this bus at that time and we we manage logistics and we um, you know we we keep an eye on the on the progress but we let people do their thing and and do what is their strength um, so I think that would be that's my personal feeling about it um, I think we do need to exercise care to make sure we're not perpetuating a system where an expert is always coming in um, and this is reflecting on my own experience as well as being the person asked to come in and do research and do I really know about the setting um, should I really have been um, the person who does this work so that's important things to ask ourselves um, and then the last one so looking at communities who, which are really vulnerable and do face significant issues and how we represent them. So I think I would say that it's about allowing communities to represent themselves in their own voice. Um, so if they use the word vulnerable and if they describe 
their situation as such, then then it's fine to you know to use their own words. But I think the problem happens when we simplify and we summarize and we find um, snappy, quick statements that can be used to summarize a one and a half hour interview, um, and that doesn't go into the nuance and the complexity and the power dynamics that underlie that conversation. And so I think. Um, we we let communities speak for themselves we don't speak for them um and and of course there are people who are in uh in need and facing vulnerability it doesn't mean we never use those terms but we let them shape what the narrative is and i think we don't do that enough we don't uh, let people describe themselves in their own words or their problem and that comes also to the questions we ask right um, so there's a great paper by tracy combs on cognitive bias I'll just pop it into the um, onto the into the chat there, um, and she talks about cognitive bias in humanitarian decision making and sense making, and her thinking is that um, we often ask questions because we have these ideas already of what the answer should be, and we think we know what the topic is, and that shapes the question that we ask. Uh, confirmation bias is another example of how this happens, where we're just waiting to confirm what we already know. I've got this idea, I saw it in this refugee camp in Kenya, so I'm sure that it applies here in Jordan. Um, and so we carry these assumptions with us and we try and prove things that we knew were trends or problems in other settings. And so that can be part of the issue as well. Whereas if we allow people to speak in their own voice and represent themselves, then it allows a different narrative potentially to come out, or at least a, a narrative that reflects what they think about themselves and not just a judgment of what we think compared to our idea of what is modern. Thank you. Uh, the whole uh, discussion how to scale up the qualitative data, but I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna continue the discussion. We have one question. Very, if you can give a very quick answer. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm just gonna say that the recording will be in YouTube. There is lots of different information that's coming that we will put in comments. So if you go to later to YouTube presentation, we will put uh, all these resources. And if you feel like sharing something. You, um, um, Dr. Lockwood, but also everyone else, if you want to put something, it would be a great place also to do that. The last question, and please, no more questions. <laughs> we are already running out of time. There is discussion about research that treats colonized bodies and subjects as subjects of research and not as subjects. What do you think about this idea? Can you say that one more time, sorry? Um, there is a discussion about research that treats colonized bodies and subjects as subjects of research and not as subjects. What do you think about this idea coming from Katusha Boyna? I'm sorry, it's probably I mispronounce your name. Yes, um, this, this is yeah a great idea and I think a good way to leave off. So Jennifer Hindman, I'm just going to paste her in the chat as well. Uh, her PhD thesis was about um, was about refugees and this very question, are they subjects or objects? Um, and she talks a lot about quantification and the objectification of refugees. So I think it's it's a really important thing to think about. How do we position them? Are they people uh, upon whom we conduct research or are they, uh, or is, there, is there a more um, equitable dynamic between us? And, um, and that's probably a good way to leave it, thinking about equity and, and power. Thank you so much. It was really wonderful. And uh, I, I can imagine we could have talked uh, even longer for that. Um, it was interesting presentation. I felt emotional as well. And uh, definitely lots of links to continue and study. And I hope everyone, everyone can do the same. It will benefit any research in social and beyond study. And so again, we will uh, record and put on YouTube um, with the different links that, um, that uh, Michelle has shared with us. and. Uh, and the trainings and I hope we can uh, maybe meet somewhere else in the different discussions. And I'll just quickly remind you about um, um, the new speaker, uh, then another speaker, um, Nicola, Dr. Nicholas Rexton. So if you're interested, please join us uh, in, on 3rd December. And uh, there should be a link on your, uh, in your chat box. Otherwise, thank you very much for, to everyone who participated with your questions, in particular the first presenters. It was really wonderful, and I'm glad that we have your presentation for, for future references. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marina. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. And feel free to reach out if you have other questions.